Yes, welcome to the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton, the Biz Communication Guy. Once again, hosting a business communication expert so that you and I will get tips and strategies that boost our business. It's an honor to host the author of this book, the book, Business is Personal, the author, Penny Power. I encourage you to go to Amazon, look up Business is Personal by Penny Power, watch the video review that I posted there, read the other reviews, and I know that right away you will want to order this book. I've read it, and again, I highly recommend it. Penny is coming to us from London, England, and along with her husband, Thomas Power, she is a globally recognized community builder. In 2014, Queen Elizabeth awarded her the Order of the British Empire, citing how Penny and Thomas helped business owners learn and use that new apparatus called the internet. Remember when you first started with it and how you needed people to help you? Penny has been a true pioneer in forming and leading two worldwide community building groups, and we'll discuss those in our conversation. It's a privilege and a pleasure to welcome Penny Power coming to us from the London area. Hello, Penny. Hi, Bill. This is fantastic. I feel a huge privilege to be on your show, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's my privilege as well, and certainly the privilege of those who are watching the interview on YouTube and listening on the podcast. Penny, I mentioned your book a minute ago, and one of the things that really stuck out to me as I read the book was how you devoted considerable attention, not only to talking about business success, but also talking about business failure. Many people who are prominent in business circles will refer only to their successes, but you talk at length about your failure and, and describe to us in two, the year 2000, you and Thomas were riding high worldwide. In 2011, that changed dramatically. Describe that to us, please, and the lessons that you learned from that that will be beneficial for us. Well, thank you. Okay, so yeah, chapter two of the book is called Being Broken. Um, let me start off by answering why would I have written that? I, I've been an entrepreneur, so I'm 58 now, and I've been an entrepreneur since I was 28. I was 33 when we came up with the idea of Academy. So pretty young, not as young as some, but you know, I was pretty young. And um, we went on quite a stratospheric ride because we were the first people to bring community or what people call social networking to the market. So four years before LinkedIn and six years before Facebook. You were a other, true pioneer. Yes, we were. I mean, we didn't know we were, you know, we just had an instinct because of both of our beliefs that there was an opportunity on the Internet to help people become friends with one another and um, particularly business people, because we love business. And it was very obvious that business people had the risk that they were going to get more disconnected and lonelier, not because they couldn't connect online, but because they weren't, you know, the more and more business owners working from home. And now with COVID, it's become even more obvious. And I've always been, I've always felt that who we are is as important, if not more important than what we do and trust and um, knowing that you having honest conversations with people has been always been very important to me. So <clears throat> we started Academy in 1998. Um, Academy, always, that, that was the name, Academy. The name, I, e -Academy. I remember being affiliated with it myself, yes. Yeah, it was beautiful and it spread by word of mouth all over the world, much faster uh, and much more successfully than either of us imagined. I mean, at the time I was at home with three young children. I'd left my executive career in the technology sector to really dedicate myself to the children. And I thought that I could do this just as a hobby. And of course, very quickly, within about three months, it became obvious that this was going to be more than a hobby. Um, so why do I share? So in 2012, without going into too much detail now, but I'm very happy to explore it. 
we really couldn't battle both the culture and the business models of LinkedIn and Facebook. And I say the culture because we believe very much in the blend of who you are and what you are. So not the polarization of I'm this person on LinkedIn, but this is my true self on Facebook. We also believe that people should pay for a community because that's a contribution to it, a bit like crowdfunding. It shows your commitment to it, but also gave us the opportunity to ensure that people were who they say they were. And we created a culture that was very, very precious and very special. And people loved it. And they would say, I use LinkedIn, but they would say, I belong to Academy. And that sense of belonging, well, it's a human need to have that sense of love and belonging is a very important need, which we wanted to service. Penny, so let, me, well, let me comment on that for just a minute, yeah. please. One, one point that occurred to me is that as I, as I read your book and as I became more familiar with your philosophy, your philosophy and Thomas that you operated with from the outset and, and that you still do, to me, there's, there's a, you have moved a step beyond what we call networking. Networking traditionally, and I, I think most people think of it this way, networking is going to an event, handing out your business card, telling people what you do, and trying to get an appointment right there, everything happening very fast and not the business is personal you're talking about. So that's traditional networking, but it seems to me that you brought in a, a much fresher and more humane approach, which was community building. Am, am I seeing that correctly? No, you're absolutely right. And I think networks exist and they're very powerful. And I think you tend to hear people say, I use a network. Uh, we're trying to satisfy a, a basic human need, which is a sense of belonging, which you might get from church or you might get inside a company that might feel like a family. But in business, it's very hard to get that sense of belonging. And one of the things that I truly believe is that we need to normalize the experience of being an entrepreneur. And unfortunately, what's happened with social media is people have created an identity that isn't necessarily their truth. And it's very hard to distinguish that. But it's also intimidating. And it also creates a lot of mental health issues, social anxiety, people feeling they're not good enough, um, people comparing themselves with a fake image of someone else. So when you have community, it's really holistic. It's the whole person. You know, so... You know, if you've got a community in your town, the person that you see running an account business who goes into church and who goes into the local coffee shop, you get to know for a whole person. And that's what we fundamentally believe. Um, and I suppose to summarize it is that we put a lot of investment into growing our knowledge capital. And of course, we have to constantly create our knowledge and grow it. I mean, you and I were joking about technology and the challenges of it. We're constantly having to learn and grow and we're constantly having to develop our skills to make sure that we're great thought leaders. So that's our knowledge capital. But we also have to constantly create our financial capital. And that's understandable. And that's where we can become quite transactional and quite focused on just the business. And I think we're in an age where our social capital is becoming a very critical asset. Um, and a community is where you create that. And when I think of the ups and downs that all of us entrepreneurs go through and the, the resilience that we have to draw on and the tenacity, I think if we have social capital, then we are able to constantly reform ourselves and grow and innovate because the same people come on the journey with us, but they just realize that you're also on a journey. And when I look at the reinventions that we've had, all with the same beliefs, but through different business vehicles, we have maintained, like, like you, Bill, we've known New Year's, we've maintained the same connections and people trust Thomas and I because we have never varied from our values, no matter what adversity we've gone through. Well, getting back to uh, a point I was making a couple of minutes ago, the fact that you talk about how your business failed, the value of that is that a great majority of people, especially entrepreneurs, and I've been one now for 25 years, the great majority of entrepreneurs are, however 
good their plans, however strong their energy, however clear their vision is, a great majority of them are going to have disappointments. And let's use the word, they're going to have failures. So to me, when I read your book, and when I have known you and Thomas for more than two decades, and I say, gosh, this could even happen to them. There's comfort in, in recognizing that, as we put it these days, you have been, been authentic. You've, you've let us know that you were vulnerable. And it's, it doesn't discourage us. You did that to encourage us. If we overcame the depths, and you talk about practically losing everything and, and the mental anguish and the disappointment that came with that and, and the isolation, which you weren't used to, you, d you told that to tell the rest of us, hey, there's a path to coming back and, and being successful again, right? Yeah, and I appreciate the way you've digested that and then shared it, Bill. And it's absolutely, I mean, look, at I think America and the American society and culture is, it is about the fact we've just got to keep going. Entrepreneurialism um, is, is very powerful in America. I would say you were a, a long way ahead of the UK um, for many, many years in that. Um, and we have to come back from adversity. And what I really believe is it's within adversity that we innovate because we, when we went into COVID, for example, on that, I think it was on the 22nd of March, 2020, I put out a video um, to anybody going through it because I know that pain, that fear. I know the sequence of emotional events that happen. And it's at those points when you start to have to be creative and innovate, but you innovate to what the market needs right now, because if you're tuned in, your innovations are so relevant. And um, so I just think adversity, first of all, leads to more happiness because you're every time you hit a bump, you're fine tuning your path and, and learning how to avoid those bumps. So I think resilience isn't about how many times can somebody hit me in the face or in the belly when, when I'm in a boxing ring, Resilience is about knowing how to avoid that, that punch. And that comes from wisdom. And so I, I don't think we should fear adversity because we come through it if we know what our impact that we want to have on the world is. And I think that's very important. From a little girl all the way through to my 10 years in corporate life, all the way through to my start, starting life into entrepreneurship, to this day, I've been very driven for people to know that they matter, um, that they have a sense of belonging and that they feel loved. And to me, creating community is the manifestation of my values, um, of my purpose. And I believe that other businesses should do that. You know, I, there's this phrase I use, community-led growth. And I think communities actually will become a, a proper revenue stream for most businesses, if not all businesses, because looking after our clients and our stakeholders closely so that they can be truthful to one another is, is a really important and very powerful way to, to build our social capital around our business. And elaborating on that thought of community, we've talked about academy. Now you and Thomas are engaged in, you formed and, and you're leading, you're promoting, you're advancing. BIP 100, what is that please? So BIP stands for Business is Personal. So we call it BIP 100. And it's a community that will never have more than 100 people in it. And it's for um, experts in a particular field who own their own businesses to come together and through the diversity of that expertise, but the commonality of the kindness and the culture that they, they have and that they believe in, um, they, will they remain in that community and rather than a network that people come and go, we will see people are saying, you know, I'm here for the long term and they're innovating ideas together. They're working on projects together. They're coming together um, and truly treating it like family and the way that family treats one another, good families. Um, so we started that in October, 2020. Um, and we have currently 76 members. Um, so, we are constantly searching for people who 
want that sense of community and are willing to have that vulnerability themselves so that people can give to them as well as that ability to give to others and that reciprocity that works in communities so well. I'm wondering if the isolation that so many of us were forced to go through because of COVID, when we didn't go to our offices, when we couldn't go to the theater, when we couldn't go to sports events, when we couldn't go to school, it would seem to me that when that was forced upon us, the idea of community becomes far more appealing. Maybe in ordinary times when we had a choice whether to go someplace or whether not to go, whether to participate or not to participate, we often chose not to participate. But it's just a you and, and every other author talk about our need to associate. And so it would seem to me, certainly, I'm not, I'm not uh, endorsing COVID or what happened because of it. I'm just saying that it, it drove us to recognize how much we were missing when we didn't have that interaction, that fellowship that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so relevant that you say that. And I think, again, there lies the beauty within the adversity of COVID because we're all, we're all going to look to ways to survive, both physically and mentally. And, and things will show up in our lives when we go through adversity that we then need to heal. And um, look, most of us in business are in danger of defining ourselves purely by how many pound notes or dollars go through our till every day, okay? Whether it's e-commerce or in a retailer or it's delivering a service-based product a service-based business and if we define ourselves purely by that we're not defining ourselves by contribution or connection or creativity or just knowing that we matter to others and it's very dangerous because the growth in business loneliness is quite phenomenal and I know that because I monitor it through a survey that I do through my website which is a, a business health check and there's a question in there of have you experienced business loneliness in the last 90 days? And consistently over 67 percent of people, that's the lowest it's ever been. Business people say that they experience business loneliness. Now, business loneliness doesn't mean that you don't have a loving spouse or children or friends. Business loneliness means you are isolated inside a business world where you don't know whether you have relevance, whether you matter to others whether people would notice if you didn't exist anymore. It affects your motivation and your mojo. It affects the way you innovate because you're not close enough to people to hear what they need. Um, and it, it just ultimately does affect your, your income. But a lot of people don't realize that looking after that aspect of your well-being is important until they do it. And there's a great saying by Lao Tzu who isn't alive now, he was 630 BC, but he said to know but not to do is not yet to know. Ah. And so sometimes people have to step into a community and experience it to really understand the impact it has. I wrote a blog in 2002 called Emotional Wealth Leads to Financial Wealth. And I think when we're emotionally strong and we're connected and we feel that we matter and our self-esteem rises and the value we place on ourselves rises, then our financial results rise. And that is the message that I want to spread to people and help them to create their version of BIT100 through programs, which we call community-led business growth. One of the phrases in your book that grabbed me and, and I love it every time I, I look at it is where you say that your mission, which you you discovered quite early in life, your mission is connecting hearts. That is marvelous. Yes. That is marvelous. I, I wish all of us could adapt that, could adopt it, could live it, because our, our income is great, our financial security is great, but what's more satisfying than connecting hearts? And we have time for just one more comment from you, Penny. And in your book, in fact, this is about the last page, I believe, you close the book by saying your brand is you. Mm. 
They are buying the lovely person who wants to have an impact. And to me, that, that capsules what you're saying about business being personal. They're, people are, are, are not buying a bargain. They're not buying a product. They're not buying a service. They're buying you. And, and until they buy you, they're not going to buy any of the rest of it, are they? Well, they're certainly not going to stick with you through thick and thin. And, you know, there's, you know, you might get instant business. We can all just go out there. And if we were absolutely starving, we could walk out into the street and we could get some money. But that's not sustainable. And if we want to create sustainable business where we grow with a client and the client grows with us, uh, and where our reputation precedes us and um, where our values are really embedded in, in the aura almost that you have online and face to face. It has to be about brand you. And, and I think that brand you is really emerging now and is where, again, back to that subject, is where you grow your social capital. Um, and it do doesn't happen fast. You can't be looking for fast results when you're doing that. But long term, it's what will feed you well into your, your old age. You and Thomas have demonstrated that very well because your brand is you. Penny, it's been such a wonderful treat to host you on the Biz Communication Show. I know that our YouTube viewers and our podcast listeners would very much like your contact information. So oh. share that with us, please. Well, that's very kind. Um, so my LinkedIn is Penny Power. Um, please do link in with me if you like. I also run a newsletter um, on LinkedIn now. I've just started it. There's been three weeks of newsletters all about this subject. Um, so you can always add a comment in there if it, and I would get in touch with you. Um, my website is pennypower.co.uk. Um, and I'm very easy to reach Penny, uh, Penny Power on Twitter. So I'm very easy to reach and I, I love making new connections. Thank you. And since Penny has given her contact information, I'll give mine Bill Lampton, the biz communication guy. So logically, my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. Encourage you to go there. Check my services for corporations and leaders. And also, I encourage you to sign up for my YouTube channel. It's listed as Bill Lampton, PhD, because you will find this interview there. You will find interviews with many other outstanding business leaders. All the business, biz communication show Interviews are on there and other instructional videos to YouTube, Bill Lampton, PhD. Penny, 20 seconds of closing thoughts. Well, oh gosh, I don't know. Just to say that I think um, the world needs great humans, kind people. And I don't think it has to be at the expense of your wallet. I think, in fact, it will grow your wallet. Thank you so much. Again, thanks to those of you who joined us on YouTube and on the podcast. Be with us next week again for the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton, the Biz Communication Guy.